Hello everyone, this is Nairi from Low Carbon Fasting. Um, okay, so this episode is uh, going to be part of the series called Type 1 Diabetics Talk, where both host and guest are Type 1 Diabetics, and you guessed it, we talk about <laughs> Type 1 Diabetes related stuff. Um, so please check out the playlist on my channel called Type 1 Diabetics Talk. And don't forget to subscribe, not only for Type 1 Diabetes related discussions, but also broader health and nutrition related topics. So today's guest um, is a fellow Type 1 <laughs> Diabetic. He's a young man, a very inspiring young man from Australia who recently actually broke a world record in oh. powerlifting yay yeah. powerlifting so he'll tell us all about it now we're also joined by um his uh, father who's a nutrition researcher founder founder of optimizing nutrition who understands not only nutrition but type 1 diabetes like no other because <laughs> his wife is also type 1 diabetic so michael kendall and Marty hey. Kendall, welcome to Low Carbon Fasting. Hey. hey, thanks. Great to chat again. Thank you, Marty. Okay, so Michael, Mike, I'm going to call you Mike. Okay, so Mike, <laughs> why don't you tell us, <laughs> uh, why don't you take us through your uh, story of diagnosis and, and, um, and, and well, well tell, tell us how old you are. I think you're 16, right? Yeah, 16. Um, we got Maccas and then <laughs> dad was like, hmm. <laughs> It's like, mm, what's that going to do in your blood sugars? We did a blood sugar test um, and I was 23. So I was a little bit high. And then we went, mm, might be the right, I don't know. <laughs> we went to the hospital, got a diagnosis. And yeah. Yeah. He uh, it yeah was enjoying a bit of fast food in his teenage growth <laughs> stage. And I was ragging him going, yeah, I don't think that's the best option, son. And uh, then, then one day after his doing some squats and uh he said oh i'm gonna test my blood sugars and it was yeah 23 and i was like oh no and i think i know what that means so yeah it's crazy yeah. a1c of 14.4 when you said a little bit high you know 20 <laughs> a little bit high yeah. <laughs> like, yeah just a little bit high it's yeah it's very very high yeah. My, that was fairly recently right yeah very recently i think what was it about, Seven... a, about a year ago exactly oh well we got diagnosed on the 17th of december so yeah. When was that? Yeah, just over a year yeah. ago. Just oh, over a year ago. Mm -hmm. uh, but, okay, so Mike, um, you would have been familiar with type 1 diabetes. Oh, very you, familiar. You grew up with your mother who's had type 1 diabetes since she was 10. Mm -hmm. So yeah. how, much, how, how, how much did you know about type 1 diabetes before you were diagnosed? Quite a bit. I'd lived with it mm -hmm. for a bit and yeah. Um, yeah, I so saw how it happened, you know, that I had to take care of it. Otherwise, I'd get yeah, pretty messed up. <laughs> so, yeah, knew about the pump, knew about insulin, needles, all that stuff. I think we were more in shock than he was initially. Yeah. So he just accepted it. And <laughs> mum and I were like, oh, we were in yeah, a bit of grief and shock for about a month. And then we just got on with it. So once we got the insulin, he just... Mm -hmm grew and oh, got stronger and so nice. <laughs> he, he he loved it so yes. yeah he, it's like he, oh my goodness he got to lift more mm. did you uh did you get an insulin pump straight away oh we got needles for the first needles. bit yeah it's about mm. three or four months in we got the pump mm. do you think the pump um it sort of is uh, a, a a better option for you or I would like you prefer I to like yeah. You like the pump, yeah. yeah. Well, Obviously, I yeah. do too. I wear the Omnipod. So your yes. pump is, a, is it, it's a tubed one, right? Your yeah, it's a tubed one. I'm not as cool as you, show, but show me, show me you so. so yeah, can we see oh. it? Yeah, amazing. So where do you usually mm. keep it? Ah, uh, just my pocket. In your and pocket. And then insert it on my stomach. Right, um, Mike. Does it get in the way of <laughs> your mm. training? 
Because no, you're lifting weights all the time. So do, do you ever like drop it or does it become a Ooh. bit of a hassle? We've got a slight crack on it because I've dropped it <laughs> once. <laughs> Which dad was not happy about. Teenagers. Um, He'll often take it off when he's yeah, training. So. Because I'm drifting down when I'm lifting weights. So, yeah. Okay. Well, so... there's a little bit of a spike because of the adrenaline, and then it's just a little drift. Marty, you're going to explain that. So, so there was a spike and the drift because you understand mm. the mechanics of it. Um, yeah. So, because for most people, when you're doing anaerobic exercises, like like lifting, right? Um, when I'm when I go to the gym, I'm not a power lifter, but when I'm lifting weights, <laughs> I'm obviously stressing the muscles, so my blood sugar usually rises. Yeah. Um, but you've noticed that after the rise, then you get a drop. So what's happening mm. there, Marty? Yeah, I suppose just when you get an adrenaline burst of adrenaline when yes. you're scared or stressed or you're lifting something really heavy or trying to sprint, you get that adrenaline which uh, forces out glucose, glucagon from your liver, like the glucagon and uh, insulin are sort of opposing hormones and glucagon forces out the glycogen from your liver, turns into glucose in your blood. So it's just your stored energy gets forced out. Um, but he doesn't mind having glucose a little bit higher. Um, mm. You know, anything under seven is probably a happy place to be while he's lifting mm. and doesn't want to be rock bottom and it's yeah not as safe yeah. to be low but then he'll when eat going... afterwards <clears throat> sorry uh when i'm going up i notice an increase in performance rather than drifting down yeah he, do he doesn't want to be low when he's trying to lift really heavy hmm. that's interesting so so when you notice uh you you you're rising like a sharp rise and you're mm. power lifting for example then mm -hmm. then do you uh take insulin to correct it or do you just let Ooh. it be i just let it be because it's normally a crash at the end mm. i think if i took extra insulin insulin on top of that then mm. it would kind of just i'd go way too low yeah often after the exercise the muscles just soak up all the glucose in your bloodstream like it's all released into your bloodstream but then they just because your muscles have used all that glucose gets sucked back into your muscles mm. and uh and you your blood sugar often crashes yeah you see i don't don't do that but i think that's something i should do next time i'm gonna try it out i usually because i know i'm gonna rise my blood sugar is gonna rise and quite often my because i have the uh, uh freestyle libre yep you know it gives a you can see, look, look at the graph and the prediction and the arrows like going right up, like straight up. <laughs> and that's the only time it goes straight up unless mm. I have a, really? like a pod or pump failure. If it's yeah. failing, it's not delivering insulin, it's going to rise. But it's definitely not related to the food I eat. And I will talk mm. about food in a minute. But but what I do is when I see that arrow going up, like, like I'm scared, how high is it going to go? So I know it's going to go up. So just before I hit the gym, I take a bit of insulin, maybe like half a unit, right? Yeah. Uh, 0.5. Not and, too much, yeah. and that kind of stop it rising because mine would definitely mm -hmm. go right up to like Keep eight, even nine. Yep. Um, mm. so, uh, so I do that and then, uh, I don't drop too low because I haven't yeah. gone crazy. Like, it's not a crazy amount of insulin. Half a unit is, you know, yeah. not crazy amount. So I do that and it seems to work for me. So, but we'll see. Um, yeah, yeah. I'll just, and then do you uh, eat after the workout? I eat after the workout. Yeah. Yeah. Stuff, yeah. yeah that, that's a, often the best way is you get really hungry and your blood sugars drop. So that sort of eating after the workout is a really good approach for most people. Otherwise you get really, really hungry and just demolish the fridge, yeah. whether you type one or not. Oh, I know. Yeah. But it's interesting because when I'm done with a 30 minute of workout, for example, I'm walking back to the gym and of mm. course the walking also like, you know yeah. fast-paced walk so that also helps the blood sugars come back yeah. down not necessarily drop to a hypoglycemic levels but just come back down and then i'm ready for my like first meal of the day right yeah perfect so let's talk about meals um what do you eat how do you fuel your muscles because just you know, people, people talk of protein. carbs, 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 carbs. You've got <sighs> to eat your carbs. You've got to eat your or drink, <laughs> even worse, 
drink your sugary drinks. The leucosate is what we have in there. I don't know what you have in Australia. You know that sugar sort of, it's it's the equivalent of the Gatorade. Gatorade. Yeah, we've got Gatorade here. Um, yeah. If he has a Gatorade, it's it's low sugar, zero yeah. sugar. Oh, zero sugar. Gatorade, so. yeah. Zero um, sugar is pretty so good. So yeah. are you fueling your <laughs> muscles with uh, sugar? Not really, unless I'm competing and i just need that little bit of extra boost and i'll take any advantage i can get um i'm normally just fueling with fat probably on about 30 grams of carbs a day so low carb and a lot of protein a lot, a lot of, protein. of protein that's a what lot I of protein. protein so what so what uh, what are your protein cho- choices uh real food protein or um um like protein like whey protein or whatever protein shakes um, or both previously a little bit of both when rugby season hits i like fueling up with a mixture of protein and glucose Mm -hmm. and that kind of keeps it high for about 40 minutes and then i come back down after the game um but mostly just steaks eggs meat (laughs) he's a mean cook actually yeah you just get get in the kitchen and make this that and the other and egg whites and omelets and gets into it yeah when cutting yeah, when he was trying to lose weight for this last competition yeah. to get a little bit lower, yeah, a lot of egg whites. A lot of egg whites. Without, without the yolk, right? Without the yeah. fat. Yeah. 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 You have this massive bowl of egg whites and it's like 100 calories. <laughs> so, yes! That's great. That's mm. amazing. So, uh, so do you notice that with um, um, protein, mm. obviously you're not eating moderate amount of protein. You're eating a lot of protein and you need mm. it. You need it yeah. for your performance. But do you notice that protein has any impact on your blood sugars? Ooh. Um, with very quick acting protein, like whey protein, yes. definitely. There's yeah. definitely a little bit of a boost up. Longer acting protein, like steak and eggs and egg whites, there's not a massive difference. Um, could do an extended bolus. I think my mum does a six hour about 50 grams of carbs for a steak, Mm -hmm. but there's not too much of a massive thing. Yeah. So I sometimes do an extended bolus. Extended bolus for the, yeah. 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 But you, because he's quite metabolically healthy and lean, Mm -hmm. it just doesn't seem to need to, he doesn't need to worry that much about the protein with the dosing, but yeah, the, the wife will definitely need a little bit of, insulin for the protein to keep it stable mm-hmm. but yeah when he was um playing a lot of rugby he realized that the the, the whey protein powder would actually mm. give him a bit of a bump up in the blood sugars but quite stable at the same time so to get him through training or a game if you were um, glucose you'd just go up and down and feel really dodgy when you'd be going down and kind of get sluggish towards the end of the game mm. and you definitely need that performance at the end of the game so mm. a longer acting protein or a longer acting kind of glucose source like protein would be good. Mm. Yeah. I mean, that's understandable. And, uh, you know, especially real food <laughs> proteins yeah. like eggs and, uh, you know, mm. like yesterday uh, for dinner, I had uh, whole eggs, not just the whites, but, mm. but I didn't take any insulin for it because um, yeah. it was just eggs. It was just eggs. Mm. And, um, I think it was three, four, four hours later, I noticed that I'm having a slight rise and then I took mm. my insulin then and that was yeah. it. It kept me sp- stable yeah. through the night. <clears throat> so um, so what's, what, what are your preferred choices of protein? Ooh, normally, normally we get a, like a big, big batch of Super Butcher order, <laughs> which is just so about a steak every second day or something. Yeah. And, He's, he's expensive to feed. I have very... <laughs> <laughs> but um, we get these like hundred boxes of burgers and they're very cheap kind of fatty burgers. So if I'm kind of needing those little bit extra calories, then yeah. some like fatty burgers or some good lean steak, if I'm kind of cutting down. So yeah, definitely just real protein sources, meat. There's not too much of protein powder at the moment because um off season i don't really yeah. need that it's more when i'm doing something aerobic that i'll eat protein powder okay so let's talk about exercise obviously mm-hmm. you're you're 
do lifting. What else do you do? Mm -hmm. You mentioned rugby. Yeah, yeah, it's a little bit of rugby. He's rugby captain for yeah. the school next okay. year for year, year 12. So he loves his rugby. Loves rugby. How amazing. So rugby, lifting. And yeah. so, uh, so you're pretty active. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Was it a bit of a surprise, Marty, when, uh, you know, he was diagnosed as a type 1 diabetic? Because, because he was always an active, physically active um, a, a, a teenager, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, and we thought he got through that phase of the growth spurt and where type 1 often happens that like few both kids have made it through and then it's like Surprise! Oh, yeah. <laughs> so yeah we, we just thought he was really active and like he was a bit leaner and he's always been a bit you know bodybuilding conscious and following the the bodybuilders on instagram and wanting to look shredded and there he was losing weight and you're going he's looking skinny I was, I was, but he's eating a lot i was What's eating going like on? five thousand four thousand calories a day so this massive amount of calories he was just oh. eating a lot and yeah it was like what is happening and he had a lot of carb cravings just because the glucose was going mm. straight through him and i think the body was just going give me carbs because I, I can't get the glucose into my system and i suppose he had some muscle cramps at night occasionally but there were no other signs until we randomly tested his blood sugars and it's like 23 wow that's, <laughs> that's huge and um yeah so we knew what that meant and took him off to the doctor and got some tests and off to the hospital and got insulin and yeah but no ketones luckily and and no, no diabetic oh. ketoacidosis so really no symptoms other than a bit of weight loss he got down to 77 kilos and then bounced up to like 88 or something yeah <laughs> put, on, put on 10 kilos in the next couple of weeks basically so yeah got back to where he should have been yeah and mm. added 40 kilos to his deadlift in a couple of weeks it was fantastic so yeah i'm i'm i i'm trying to tell people hey look at this kid insulin's not evil insulin in the right dose in response to the right food is mm -hmm. an asset so if you've got a great body composition that should be the focus and you need insulin to build that and to metabolize the protein but yeah so it hasn't hurt him it's helped him if anything well, thank you for mentioning the insulin, because I think uh, a lot of type ones who are now conscious or, uh, you know, or, uh, conscious of the low carbohydrates or way of eating, mm. right? To sort of look at insulin as like the enemy. So take as little insulin as possible, but insulin should be uh, look, looked at, you know, in context, in, yeah. in context of, you know, lean body mass and exercise. Yeah then insulin is really not your uh, sort of enemy. Without insulin, you're not going to build muscle, by the way. Mm, <laughs> right, Marty? Yeah, yeah he, he was disintegrating before our eyes, basically, and everybody would disintegrate if they weren't producing enough insulin. So, yeah, and I think the key with type 1 management is the majority of your insulin needs to be basal insulin, like 70 to 80% tends to be basal insulin just to hold your body together keep your blood sugars stable and then eating in a way that doesn't leave you on a massive roller coaster. So that's where insulin is, becomes a real hassle. If you're taking a lot of fast acting carbs, eating garbage, you can't predict what your blood sugar is going to be. And once blood sugars are stable, it's so much easier to manage. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, you did mention that, that, Mike, you don't seem to have too much uh, trouble dosing for um, a protein. No, really not. But but your mum does, for example, she has to take insulin or more insulin uh, for protein. Now that's that yeah. it's it's a big challenge. I have I have to admit, I mean, I've been on the low carbohydrate diet for seven years now. I'm still learning because you know what works one day doesn't necessarily work the next day. But what yeah. what, what is different today? I'm having exactly the same meal, totally. same routine. I started off with the same same mm. way. And, you know, nothing different today. Why did, you know, like two units up front for my steak yesterday work perfectly? Today, it doesn't seem to work. So 
maybe it's the hormones as well and not maybe yeah. but definitely of course i mean they they play havoc right and yeah, teenage yeah. hormones hormones too but also mm -hmm. you know when you get to my age <laughs> female hormones um also play havoc on your uh, sort of blood sugar so what's happening yeah, there marty there doesn't seem to be one single formula for dosing for protein that <laughs> works every single time uh, for every single that type one diabetic i mean it's hmm. for me this is one of the biggest challenges yeah as a general rule um like the the food insulin index data shows that protein needs about half as much insulin as carbohydrate per gram over the first three hours but like you said that's just a guideline to like you could dose up front um maybe use, some people use a longer acting insulin up front or the the square wave extended bolus or with the closed loop systems it's becoming a whole lot easier because the the response to protein is very gentle and then the the closed loop systems just accommodate that protein so i think just bumps up your base a little yeah what once you're using a, most people are using a closed loop system which will be available in the next few years for everybody i think I they won't have to worry about it yeah mike is probably a couple of weeks away from getting a closed loop Ooh, pump which will be great we're and excited we're excited you won't have to be consciously managing it and like you're saying what how do i calculate it and what do i do and i have to think about it just takes the decisions out of it and is a little bit more on autopilot which would be great everything other than carbs it just works fantastically but carbs are just too quick for the closely. yeah so you'll still have to announce the carbohydrate and tell it you i'm about to have carbohydrate and it'll dose for that but for the rest of it you hardly need to mm. announce anything it just sees your blood sugars mm. going up and says well we're going to give you more increase your basal insulin for the next half an hour until it mm -hmm. starts to head back down mm -hmm. so mike so when so uh so you don't seem to experience much trouble dosing for protein. Um, Not too much. But if you are uh, combining, say, all three macronutrients, fat, mm -hmm. protein, and some carbs mm -hmm. for your performance, right? Mm -hmm. How do you dose for it? Do you actually uh, like uh, take into account the fat as well? because fat will slow down the absorption of both protein and carbs a little bit. So how do you calculate that? <laughs> so, random guess. <laughs> random yeah, guess, yeah. It, I mean, that's it definitely bit, starts to get a lot, lot more complex. Yeah. You go, yeah. pro, uh, what is it? Protein is three hours. Carbs are about half an hour. Mm -hmm. Fat is about eight to 10 hours-ish. And then you just figure out the ratio between that yeah Yo. but 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 that's the challenge with uh having those mixed meals mm. for type ones it, mm -hmm. it's it's a real mess and that's where dr bernstein's approach of the law of small numbers if you if you take the big variables out and reduce the carbohydrates then it's much easier to dose for protein which is a slower response and fat mm. which is an even a a longer blood sugar response so it's just takes out the errors and that's where the magic for type ones and low carb is that it just you're not fighting the roller coaster these massive swings it just, it's much easier to correct the small blips rather than always being on that roller coaster going high and crashing and high and crashing which is a, a nightmare <laughs> and unfortunately and mike never had to go through that although we went to the hospital and they told us the same thing that mm, they gave me a sandwich at the end <laughs> yeah, uh, told him the same thing that hmm. mum got told 30 years before and it's like this stuff is crazy why are you telling people the absolute wrong advice to get stable blood sugars yeah um i think there are so many um variables um uh, uh, that, that that have an effect on mm. your uh, blood sugar right i mean from exercise mm. to what type of exercise it is or mm. uh um T -t time of the month for for females yeah. and uh, for teenagers for example growth hormones so mm -hmm. there are so many things that impact right impact uh, your blood sugars so at least removing one variable mm. or, uh, will reduce the risk i mean that's why i do low carb when someone asks yeah. i say well that's one 
thing of the many things that will have an impact mm. on my blood sugar. But if I can yeah. reduce my carbohydrates, then I'm reducing the risk of highs and lows. It doesn't mean I'm never having highs or lows, but you know, I'm at least reducing the risk or yeah. the highs and lows are less severe. Um, yeah. So what and eating of- trashy carbs is is the major variable. Mm. It's the biggest factor. And then once you've stabilized it, it's much easier to manage those little swings. And if he needs to eat glucose to bump his gl- blood sugars back up, then you can just eat a measured amount rather than having to, yeah. it's an emergency and I have to get my blood sugars up and eat a whole lot. And you always overeat when you're really, really low. So the jelly beans oh, tell me about it. Tasty. <laughs> And you don't even need to be low. So if you're crashing from a high, yeah. high of, Ooh, I don't know, like 12, bad, yeah. 13, and you're crashing suddenly or quick crash, mm. uh, and you hit seven, I'm shaking at seven. Yeah. And seven isn't hypoglycemia, you know, yeah. but I'm shaking. And I open the fridge door. And as you said, I could devour everything. Yeah, it's, it's, horrible it's mindless at that the point. The whole chicken is just gone. <laughs> well, I forget the chicken. Like, I look for jars of jam, which actually I don't have. And I know I don't have. <laughs> I haven't had a jam jar for like years in my house. But I just like hopelessly looking at the fridge door just in case <laughs> I can find something. Because I'm craving carbs, right? So yeah. it's a horrible feeling if a horrible mm. feeling so if you can reduce the the highs and the lows mm. um well then you've kind of you've partly won the battle right mm. all the percentage error just happens in 20 minutes and you can't deal with it all in 20 minutes because every tool that you've got last for insulin takes two hours to actually do its thing yeah mm. so you just messed up if you have to deal with error in 20 minutes yeah it's just impossible to match the fast acting insulin which isn't that fast the rapid acting mm. insulin just doesn't match the response to carbohydrates so it's just really difficult so minimizing the for type ones is a no-brainer oh if i do want to eat some sort of carbs i'll wait until i'm like four four point five i'll dose insulin from where i am wait till i'm four point five or four or wait as long as possible and then have my carbs and then they'll boost me up mm. and that's the way to stay like yeah. so he does a good job of pre bolusing when he when he he's going to have something mm. when he's low. Mm. Mm-hmm. Uh, what, Mike, what kind of insulin do you use now in your pump? Is it fast uh, acting? Nova Rapid. Yeah. Yeah, Nova Rapid. Like that's the mm. one I use too. Um, so um, I lost my track of thought. Now that's my alarm to wake me up. But I woke up an hour <laughs> earlier today, so I can. In fact, I woke up two hours earlier, so that's when I would usually wake up. I'm sorry. To chat to um, us. Yeah. <laughs> You're doing well for talking in your yeah. sleep. Yeah. I suspect there's many cups of coffee involved in this. Coffee, two cups, and that's all I have. Okay, so uh, so you uh, yeah, I love my glucose tabs. Do you carry them around with you? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah always got some do, do you know what i've noticed i don't know if you noticed that because i mean your context is a bit different from mine yeah. <laughs> you know uh you're heavily into you know your, your workouts but mm-hmm. have noticed that when i'm slightly low like 3.5 mm-hmm. 3.4 for example right mm-hmm. i mean it's not like a major hypo 3.4 i'm still feeling still fine feeling i'm functioning yeah. well but mm-hmm. i noticed that I mean, here's a half on the top because uh, I've eaten the other half. So half a glucose tab, because the, the wow. full glucose tab is four grams of carbs. So half is like two grams of pure glucose, right? That does the job. Yeah. That brings me right back up again. And I'm normal and I'm staying stable. So you don't even, because before I would take like four in one go and then i would be surprised why did i rise from four to now now i'm like 16 why i mean that's why because i never had any guidance of how many i actually need so i've Mm. noticed that because i'm insulin sensitive um you know Mm -hmm. i I actually need very little two grams of carbs my blood sugar goes back to normal yeah Yeah. and you're only you're only fairly little too so it, it doesn't take much to boost you back up yeah and the glucose tabs are really nice because it'll just give you a sharp rise and stop so so that's the great thing even compared to jelly beans or honey or some other thing that tends to be glucose and and fructose together yeah it just it's just a bump back up and flat it's great um but i'll 
hammer down a few more than half a glucose tab. <laughs> if he's low. Yeah. Um, I don't know how many grams there are on each, but I'll have, yeah, a few. I guess I'm 90 kilos and I'd need a little bit more, but it's definitely good to have a measured amount and not going, oh, tasty. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you might need more because obviously you're, you're uh, you, you know, you have a, a bigger muscle mass and you're performing, you. so you mm -hmm. probably will need more glucose. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so, Mike, tell us about how uh, your so how how much of your insulin is basal at the moment, and how much is bolus. People, if you're listening, you're type one. It doesn't mean you know you have to do what Mike is doing. I mean, we're all different. Our context is different. But people always ask, right? How much insulin do you take daily? And I was like, <laughs> okay, that's not how you judge my health and my, you know, my well-being. But people yeah. are always interested. So just for the sake of sort of interest, can you yeah. tell people? Because there might be teenagers watching watching this. In yeah. fact, there might be parents of type mm -hmm. one diabetics watching this. Um, so how much uh, of your insulin is basal insulin at the moment? It's about about seventy percent and about twenty eight units a day of basal and then he'll bolus for that on top of that so yeah mm -hmm. 28 units of basal so yeah so do you think your basal insulin is basal dose is correct so for example if you're late for your i don't know for your mm -hmm. meal mm -hmm. um you're on the road right you're driving so does it start yeah. dropping or do you yeah, think your well, basal is correct pretty much We've got it fairly well yeah. fine tuned. Each week, I'll get the there's a percentile chart in Night mm. Scout that you can see the the highs and lows, and I just fine tune it to make sure he's never going low, and then adding enough to get it down most of the time. So that basil is probably covering a little bit of the the protein, which might be why he doesn't need to dose as much for protein. I'll but, have the same amount of protein every meal about. Yeah, he's got about the same appetite most yeah. days. So yeah, but 70 to 80% is is basal, which is really much easier to control and so manage. And once you've got the basal locked in and got that right, yeah. everything else is so much easier. So, Mike, we talked about, uh, you know, how your performance and exercise. So you're at school. <laughs> yeah. How do you manage your uh, sort of insulin intake and blood sugars at school? Do you find yourself dropping or rising? And do you like scan or do you use your your, your phone to scan your... Uh... Oh, I've got a Dexcom. Oh, you've got but, a Dexcom. Yeah. Yeah, so Bluetooth. But yeah, just sometimes check my phone in class, get a look from the teachers going, why are you on your phone? But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but they've let him have the phone yeah. at school. So. Mm -hmm. so so you have to do it completely on your own, right? I mean, you're able to yeah. do it, like yeah. manage the lows and the highs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, he's, he's very independent. Yeah, I'll have some glucose in my bag or something and always carry something on me. And yeah, I've got insulin in the pump, got glucose in my pocket. Yeah, there's no hassle now. It's yeah. like after the first couple of months, it was like, I'm, I'm, I'm good. I don't need your help, Dad, anymore. I've got Wait, this Dad. typical teenager, but luckily, <laughs> luckily, he's worked it out pretty well. I wouldn't necessarily say typical teenager. You know, it does affect teenagers, <laughs> you yeah. know, uh, in in a negative way too. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because I get uh, parents, you know, writing to me. Mm -hmm. um, a teenage and uh, my teenager is now refusing to take their insulin or whatever. I mean, they, mm. they're not all like you, Mike. So that's this is yeah. why I invited you to this channel so we can have a discussion <laughs> and you can hopefully inspire other uh, people uh, of your age, telling mm. them, "Hey, be optimistic. I mean, this is not the end of the of, 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 of your life. <laughs> Just manage it and do what mm. it takes, and you can yeah. have a very meaningful and completely productive life." So tell I us about you. Uh, you know, you, uh, it's, okay, school. What do you eat at school? School lunches. <laughs> Uh, ah, not the normal and... sandwich. Yeah, but pe people ridicule him for his funky lunches that that does mom, sometimes mom support makes. The week. There's a lot of love in these lunches, but <laughs> they're yeah. No one's used to seeing like six meat patties or something in a lunchbox. But... Um, so hmm? so you are eating school lunches, uh, or you're taking uh, your lunch from home? Not really. I'm taking my own lunch. Mum normally prepares them. I do it sometimes, but normally like just a massive amount of protein so i'll have about 40 grams of pork crackle 
and then so ooh, like five beef burgers or something yeah we, we get these fatty beef burgers that have been really good for yeah. cost effective just mm. cook up a whole fridge batch, full of yeah. big batch of these fatty beef burgers that taste really good they come in boxes of 100 and they're like what 110 dollars for 100 mm. burgers yeah so <laughs> that's fantastic that's we're trying to find cost effective ways to feed the 16 year old power lifter which <laughs> yeah will never be cost effective but... <laughs> It'd be cheaper to yeah. feed him bread, but well, exa- no. But adults, teenagers aren't cost effective. Let's face it. No, no. <laughs> Nobody told us they weren't going to be cheap. Oh, no, no, they're not cost effective. They just they <laughs> eat. I mean, the amount of food that just mm. you know gets eaten is like beyond. Uh, By the way, <laughs> by dad stuff. Um... <laughs> <laughs> how do you? Uh, uh, how do your friends? Um, see you know what you do 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 they understand what do you think uh they you probably think? don't understand but they're just very loving and caring mm. like they're pretty friends. accepting yeah they're accepting it's just, there's a little are you okay every time i whip out the pump so it's nice yeah oh good oh that's really yeah. good so are you ever but, tempted to just go for that you know school sort of pizzas i mean if it's if, it, it, uh, if where you are is anything like the UK, all you get yeah. at school lunches is like the pizzas or the some kind of a pie, pastry based, whatever, or mashed Three potatoes. Or so, yeah. some bringing a cake or something. <laughs> so are you ever but, tempted um, to try one of those? Sometimes. There's occasionally I'll dose before and then wait till the end of break to have a slice if I do. But, but the fat and carbs together tends yeah. to... to be more stable than the really sugary carbs so the junk food is actually more stable than the yeah the fruit or the sugar by itself but um yeah i mean he might eat a little bit of that food when somebody wants to offload some lunch that he goes on oh, it's yummy but uh but 80 90 percent of the time he's eating really well so yeah. and definitely burning it off being really active mm. if you look at the like carbs last for about what 30 minutes they actually they have their all their kind of they go straight up yeah they just go straight up for about 30 40 minutes but fat would normally go up for about about eight hours so you kind of take the average of that if it's 50 50 fat and carbs so what it would last for about it just gives a much more stable glucose yeah. response but yeah not that he eats a lot of pizza or pasta or junk no. like that because it is really hard to dose for and you're on that roller mm. coaster but yeah you don't get yeah. too many cravings for it after a while. Mm. Yeah, if you if you're front loading the protein, you don't have the cravings for the garbage carbs. Yeah. With the uh, what is it? As soon as you hit your nutrient intake, kind of yeah, not craving too much. Once you front load the protein and you're not crashing, I think that's where a lot of type ones get into trouble. Is that they're dropping all the time and therefore they're craving the carbs and then they're on that roller coaster. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think the worst part for me, um, <laughs> oh, no, when I used to eat like pastas, like large bowls of mm. rice, and thinking that I could just cover it all with insulin. Yeah, um, dosing 20 units or something. <laughs> oh, oh my gosh. Um, I, <laughs> yeah, that's a bit of an exaggeration, but I, I wouldn't go yep. to 20 units, but I could, couldn't manage it. I mean, you use pre bolus and then halfway through your eating, you take another bolus and then later on you mm. take another roll. Whatever I tried, mm. um, nothing worked. Mm. And, you know, eventually I said, nothing worked because I was yeah. told, like, I'm not managed. In fact, <laughs> my diabetes nurse at the time at the mm-hmm. diabetes clinic told me, Nairi, you have to be more proactive. You've got a pump, be more proactive. And I've hated the word proactive since then. I haven't used it. Fair <laughs> enough. I, tell me I have to be proactive. I'm doing everything it takes. I've tried mm. every smart way of delivering my insulin. Yeah. I couldn't manage, manage the blood sugars. And then they thought, you know, I was a failure because I'm not proactive enough. Oh, did you actually try? Uh, this formula, well, what's the formula? Okay, 70% of your bolus, pre bolus, or did you try 15 minutes before instead of the 10? Like all these different suggestions, rather than telling me, well, what if you eat a piece of protein <laughs> instead yeah. of rice? 
um, yeah. or have less rice and more protein. No one ever mm. told me anything like that. So I think you were diagnosed, uh, Mike, <laughs> in a time where this low carbohydrate sort of uh, way of eating is more <laughs> prevalent. Yeah. Mm. Which is really, really fortunate. I remember when, oh, when so Moni was pregnant with, I think our first child, we went to the, the checkup at the diabetes clinic and it's like, oh, A1C is too high, I need to get it down, how do you do it? And they just couldn't tell us. And it was sort of distressing to go, well, you got this high risk pregnancy with high blood sugars and they just couldn't tell you how to do it. But once a few years later, once we worked out low carb, it's like, this is it, this is how you do it. You're off the roller coaster and you can just manage it so much more easily and it's so much less angst and stress. Mm, that like day-to-day -day error that kind of fluctuates is heavily emphasized with carbs because your percentage error, like it's still the same percent, but it's just a massive, like it's now a two mm. unit error or it's a 50 gram of carb error mm. from day to day because you took a walk or something. Mm. And you just can't deal with that error. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know, with the carb based meals, mm. I, I was always hungry. You'd think mm. carb is, you know, filling, but mm. no, I, as soon as my blood sugars would start, you know, going down, I mm. feel hungry again. I want more food. And because you're having carb heavy meals, you're likely having, I mean, Marty, correct me on this, but you, you so if you, if, if the big proportion of your food is say, I don't know, rice or pasta, mm. then you're not having as much protein. Yeah, Did definitely. definitely. That? Once people go low carb, the protein tends to come up and that's sort of the magic for everybody else who's not a type 1 diabetic for low carb is that you lower carbs and you tend to increase the protein automatically. But yeah, definitely for if you're injecting insulin for all that carbohydrate, you always make an error. And when your blood sugars are going low because you've taken too much insulin, you do get really you've hungry. Got that crashing down hunger. Yeah, which you demolish the fridge. Um, that doesn't happen in that same way with everybody else. But you kind of hit a low blood sugar even if you're not diabetic after you've had. Yeah, some people carbs, can get reactive yeah. hypoglycemia, but it's not as pronounced. And yeah, definitely, it's more about getting enough protein for everybody else. But you know, adequate protein is a big deal for everybody, mm. type one or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so Mike, tell us about, you know, how you got, you got into, um, uh, exercise. So when did you start lifting? Cause it was before your diagnosis, right? You were already lifting yeah. before. Lockdown. COVID, I went, COVID lockdown. Yeah. COVID yeah. lockdown. I was like, I'm going to be Chris Hemsworth and <laughs> I was kind of this chubby kid and yeah, I really enjoyed it. And we said, you can't become Chris Hemsworth in, in two months. So he, he just stayed in the gym downstairs in the garage. Gave for, it my best crack. For eight hours a day. And he went, yeah, maybe you can. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, he got, he fell in love with it back mm. then. That's incredible. Yeah. So what do you, um, so when you go to the gym, oh, well, when do you fit the gym workout in? Uh, you, you're going uh, to school every day. Yeah, um, we've got a gym at school, so I can go to the gym at school and then I get that little extra 20 minutes for gym that I wouldn't at home because of the drive and all that stuff. But you can always fit gym in. Yeah, and we've got a home gym yeah. with, with some barbells. So oh, it's fantastic. Great investment for the family and it's been great for both kids. Mm, but yeah, you can always find time in the day. Yeah. Move stuff around, wake up earlier. It's good for your brain. You just, I, I feel so much better when you lift something heavy. Yeah, totally. and, yeah. Just doing something hard that you don't really want to do is just massive. And it's especially to for feel strong rather than, yeah. you know, frail. Usually mm. frailty is associated with, you know, with the elderly. But there are so many people like my age, right? Mo mm. I'm probably your mother's age. <laughs> and they're already going frail. Yeah. People, people my age i mean we're middle-aged people we shouldn't really be that mm. frail or even even teenagers mm. i've been a teacher for years too. i've taught i've taught teenagers for years yeah. and in fact close to 30 years i wow. work in school settings a... right looking at some teenagers mm. I, I don't know if it's a combination of not, not enough physical activity or not, uh, or poor diet, 
Mm. They're already looking so frail. You look at them and you think, oh my goodness, I'm in one fall and you're just going to break yourself. Your yeah. Bones. It's pretty scary got... as, a, as a kid, isn't it? Yeah. That people are looking like that. And yeah, they just need to eat more protein and be more active. And when you're active, you crave the protein and it sort mm. of works together. And you've got now like video games and Instagram and all that stuff. Like you don't have to feel like a, like anyone at the moment, you can just kind of become a different person. Yeah. Disappear into virtual reality. Yeah. But I think for a teenager, I wish I had that fitness lifting strength. Cause I think as a young mm. male, especially you just feel powerful and important and you ask somebody and you feel confident and that just sets mm. you up so well for everything else. Well, you're on the right track. Uh, yeah. Mike, uh, with respect to your, you know, training and uh, and 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 diet, because if when people ask me, so what do you wish you knew, you know, thirty years ago, uh, mm -hmm. that you know now? Well, I I tell them I wish I, you know, exercised, started mm -hmm. lifting weights at a much younger age, mm -hmm. and I wish you, I wish I knew about the low carbohydrate lifestyle. These two, mm -hmm. I wish yeah. I knew like 30 mm. years ago right i've been yeah. diabetic mm. for 44 years so wow but whatever age you are it's never yeah. too late right marty you agree yeah <laughs> definitely when did you get type 1 diabetes how old were you i was five now, now i'm asking you right five yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah five four I'm 49 now, so 49 wow. and a half if half is an age but yeah, yeah so well. uh, yeah definitely i was five um, but it's interesting because I don't know if Monica can relate to this um, yeah. um, for, for our audience, Moni, Moni, Monica's uh, uh, Marty's wife, right? Um, so uh, who's also type one diabetic and she was diagnosed at age 10. Uh, 10 I yeah, very but good. When I was first diagnosed, mm -hmm. the dietary advice was like lower carbohydrates. Really? Uh, oh. Yeah, limit your rice, limit the bread, only have a quarter of a slice yeah. of the bread or whatever. That's how it was until quick acting insulin came about. Really? And then everything changed. That was about 20 years ago with, you know, Novo Rapid. It was supposed to be, I think it was marketed mm. as this, you know, magic uh, yeah. sort of pill that's supposed to, uh, to work like, you know, real insulin it's quick acting and then you don't have yeah. to watch your um your diet everything shifted yeah and That's i so remember weird. It, it well actually it was apparently mm. the same because i heard from another type one that it was the same in the united states back in the 70s wow. they were told hey limit you know limit your carbs mm. don't eat too yeah. much bread just mm. you know and uh and then everything changed because we thought, hey, we've got better insulin now, so mm -hmm. we can just, you don't have to watch your diet, just eat whatever you want, live like everyone yeah. else. And, and that actually ruined my health for 20 years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And stupidly, I welcomed that message. I don't have to limit my bread. Well, bread is delicious, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, but if you're injecting your insulin, you're just, you know, crashing your blood sugars Screw. and storing it really effectively so yeah it's the worst advice but for money she tells stories of when she was a kid um like first diagnosed giving her all this carbohydrate and then saying you have to dose for it and she was trying to hide all this extra food that she just couldn't eat that the hospital was giving her to to keep her blood sugars up for the insulin she was mm -hmm. taking it's like uh, you've got it the wrong way around <laughs> get your basil right and then just take enough insulin for the food you're eating um i remember the day i was diagnosed i was five i was at the hospital wow. and um i must have been at a pediatric sort of ward because mm. right next to me there was another bed and uh, uh, another bed and mm -hmm. there was a young boy whatever his condition mm. was right next to me so and his family in the morning i think um his family came over to visit him and they brought him like uh, a, a big sort of a plate of pastries and whatever. They offered me a piece. And uh, I don't know where my mom was at. She never left my bedside, but you know, yeah. I had, I had a piece of pastry. And then my mom walked over, a doctor walked over and they found out about it. They, that was the first time I, I, I heard that, no, that was something I shouldn't have been having. Wow. 
I that was my that. first yeah. time ever that I heard that I could no longer have, you know. Uh, Sounds like you got great it. advice in the UK and yeah. It, well, I mean, it wasn't in the UK, Martin, no, that I was, that was in the Middle East. And, really? and you know, when oh. I came to the UK, the advice completely was different. Yeah. And then I kept thinking, well, you know, doctors are so backwards in yeah. the Middle East. <laughs> That they just, uh, they just, uh, you know, told me to limit, you know, no one's limiting anything here, you know, they're just telling me yeah. to eat whatever you want and just cover it with insulin. And then if you mm. don't get your blood sugar sort of stable, they kind of, the blame is on you, right? I mean, you're not mm. proactive enough. <laughs> you've, got this, you've got this rapid acting insulin you should be right yeah it's mm. perfect and none of them actually live with type 1 diabetes it wasn't until we saw like we got to know got to know people at a low carb conference and then we got on to type 1 grit and saw all these kids and everybody else with these flatline blood sugars and mm. we finally believed it and then money believes it enough to try it and i was like oh, this is this is great i can stabilize my blood sugars and life changed for her at that point so many things improved to energy levels and mood and yeah so that's why i suppose i became quite passionate and angry in a way that i want to get good quality information out there to help people mm. and then he came along and got it so. <laughs> right after you quit engineering <laughs> yeah quit your, time. quit your day job to uh to help the world with diabetes and then, and then he, got, <laughs> he got type one uh, well i mean looking at the positive side of it you know hmm? you're diagnosed in a family that has such a good understanding oh, of, uh, of diabetes uh, type one diabetes because that's not the case with every teenager out there oh. for a lot of <laughs> yeah. teenagers unfortunately or even you know young teens tweens if you mm. like um it's it's and their parents it's like the end of the world because that's like a major diagnosis and they just don't know mm. how to handle it mm. Mm. yeah we got this book and it yeah still said fit of carbs and yeah do we have it oh. Anyway, uh, some things actually good in that book, but yeah, a lot of things are interesting. But uh, yeah, <laughs> anyway, no, it, it it was I was just happy once we got enough insulin into him to get his blood sugars down. It took a few weeks to keep on ramping up the insulin more and more and more, and um, yeah, I think he was on forty or fifty units a day initially to try and get the blood sugars back into normal range, and then we've sort of titrated it back down. Mm. But it's been I've been so grateful to have good role models and examples mm. of you know the the Dykemans and Dr Bernstein mm, and, and Jessica Butner. Oh yeah, Jessica Butner yeah. is an amazing powerlifter with type one diabetes, smashing world records, utterly, utterly smashing. Yeah, Diabe type one's a superpower. Insulin's a superpower, I think. But uh, yeah, I'm not Sim sure it's a massive benefit, but it definitely doesn't limit you in any sort yeah. of way. If you take care of it and actually treat it like it's serious, you've mm. definitely got, yeah, you're not limited. Mm. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, you know, sadly, a lot of people just sort of, um, because they can't manage their blood sugars. They've probably tried everything and it's not working. Mm. And then eventually they, uh, they kind of give up on it. Mm. Mm. So, and then when they find out, I mean, that was the case person. with me, I hated being feeling like a failure every I hated going to my diabetes clinic because I would be mm. told you're not proactive enough <laughs> I hate, oh, I hate, hate, that. hate that word don't you I hate that word um so um so we talked about uh you know glucose tabs Mike uh to to, mm. to raise your blood sugar so when do you um take glucose tab at what figure when you're feeling hypoglycemic or do you actually yeah, What's I've got it on my phone. So I'll just get a bing every time I'm below four every minute. Yeah. So every minute that I'm below four, and then I'll take a glucose tab when I realize that I'm below four. Mm. Uh, or... And you've also got an alert when it's heading above eight. So yeah. the phone will go beep, yeah. beep, beep, mm. and then he'll be proactive and, and get, <laughs> give us some insulin to get it down. Uh... <laughs> proactive. I, I use the word. No. But yeah, the, now unfriended you on Facebook. The diabetes technology is a whole lot more helpful these days. Yeah. So that was actually my next question. So when do you correct? At what sort of level do you correct uh, uh, um, your high? 
at eight. If I'm super duper stable, I'll correct that at like five point five, and I'll be super proactive or whatever. <laughs> um, but yeah, most of the time it's about six or seven that I'll correct. If You'll it's correct. just normal everyday life, yeah, I'll dose point eight units at six, and then if I'm on. A little bit less predictable and watching it a little bit less i'll dose at seven and that's about 1.2 units mm. so she's got a bit of a math brain that he understands exactly how much he needs to give and his brain Spoken works like there. a bit of a closed loop pump a lot of the time <laughs> which is handy yeah it is very mm. handy to have that you know uh, mental sort of sharpness to actually do all the calculations because you mm. still have to do even with a pump you still have mm. to do a lot of calculation mm. in your head because the pump doesn't know um how much physical activity you've just done for example mm. right um okay so what uh, we talked about your uh so to describe a typical meal for you also an important mm -hmm. question because i've i've read a lot of type 1 diabetes like mm -hmm. uh, keith runyon's book and you know bernstein's book mm -hmm. and they emphasize um consistency consistent times mm -hmm. and consistency mm -hmm. of uh meal portions how do you approach that consistency because consistency. i that's one thing i don't do because it just mm -hmm. doesn't doesn't fit. I, I, my blood sugars will probably be a lot more stable with consistent mm. meals at consistent times and physical activity mm. at consistent times. I know that I know Keith Runyon, for example, Dr. Runyon mm -hmm. emphasizes that so much. Dr. Mm. Bernstein emphasizes, you know, rigid sort of meal plans as well. I don't do that. It wouldn't fit in well with my life, but I know that mm. I would benefit from it if I could ever be yeah. more consistent. What, what, what do you guys do? I mean, how do At you... At school, you're already on a very consistent life. So during the school mm -hmm. term, I'll basically every single day have five to six burgers and 40 grams of pork crackle and maybe a little meat stick or something at lunch. And then breakfast might be eggs or something and whatever mum makes for dinner. Mm. So it's it's very regimented because I'll always wake up at the same time with school mm -hmm. and I'll always have lunch at the same time because that's when the bell rings and dinner is always relatively the same within like half an hour, an hour. Healthy meat and veggies of some sort and mum, mum's a great cook, fortunately, mm, so we're, cook. we're both very lucky there. On holidays, it's a little bit less regimented because I normally wake up at like <laughs> seven or something. I... but. Eight, yeah, give or take. <laughs> Noon. Um, <laughs> so it's a little bit less regimented there, but over holidays, like I'm constantly looking at my BGs. Mm. It's not too much of an issue there, so I can definitely manage everything. Yeah, it needs the... more monitoring, right? Yeah. Um, if if the, uh, you're out of your normal routine or when you go <laughs> uh, on holidays somewhere, for example, right? Ooh, I yeah. mean, your time zone has changed and. Yeah. Yeah, when, when, when there's other food outside the house, things always go awry and it's like, <laughs> mm, that didn't go well. Let's let's just feed him at home. Um, yeah, so... Uh, it, it, Dad goes, what did you eat? <laughs> <laughs> I'll be messaging him. I'll, I'll be watching your CGM and going, stop <laughs> eating that. <laughs> what are you eating? Uh, yeah, so... But I think the CGM technology helps a lot because, oh, like, for, for Bernstein and Runyon you'd have to set your long acting basils and those sorts of things to be very consistent and then eat for that consistent insulin mm. um, with setting a variable basil with the pump. It's really helpful. And then being able to see the CGM, it's also helpful to accommodate for that. So, yeah. And then once you get on the closed loop system, it'll be a, a lot more forgiving again, as long as you're not eating crazy garbage carbohydrate, it'll just mm. sort of manage it yeah um okay so uh, yeah uh, actually it's interesting you mentioned the school because when mm. i worked in school settings mm. <laughs> blood sugars were so, because of the set routine mm. the blood sugars were more stable i knew my i i had a basal sort of basal um uh what's it called basal uh program for yeah. uh for like for the days I was working and a different one for the weekends, right? For the days yeah. I was teaching, yeah, cool. but very regimented. Um, 
same time, different. same morning break, the bell goes at lunch, I have my mm -hmm. meal, and I would always take a, you know, a homemade meal. So it was mm -hmm. more consistent. And mm -hmm. it worked so well. And on the weekends, even though only the timings would change, not my meal plans, but mm. the times of waking up time and, mm. you know, physical activity might have been done, you know, later in the day. I, I couldn't manage my blood sugars as well mm. as, as on my, you know, work, work, school days. So that's, yeah, wow. uh, that was an interesting point. But uh, so to, tell, tell our audience, Mike, what a typical mm. meal looks like for you. So you mentioned breakfast, eggs. It might be eggs mm. for breakfast. Probably eggs. No cereal in the house or anything. <laughs> we don't yeah. believe don't I'll believe just in drink cereal. Straight maple syrup sometimes, actually. And, uh, yeah. Or spoonfuls of honey. Yes, it's yes, definitely. To be healthy, honey is healthy because uh, you know it's natural sugar, right? My oh, <laughs> natural, yeah, yeah, yeah. Glucose tabs, if you love, is the best way to go. Yeah, um, um, but it's mostly just some source of straight protein. Try to get above. 60 percent protein in your brekkie oh yeah. i normally try to get above 60. yeah some yeah generally eggs or egg whites or a bit of both and then mum will have a steak and they'll cook a steak on the barbie for lunch a mm. lot of the time together and then the family meal which is like a veggies and salad and some sort of protein with that That's good so Marty, then, you you're not type one diabetic, and your no, daughter. It's not a cool um, So your daughter is uh, a couple of years older than Mike, right? Yeah, she's eighteen. So and yeah, luckily. so she's not type one diabetic. No. But you know, from what you're describing, everyone in the family is actually following similar meal plans. You're not sitting in there and you know stuffing your faces with donuts while Mike. No, and, no, you know, no, 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 and. and... <laughs> And Jazz might tolerate a bit, a bit more carbohydrate occasionally, but she definitely is very health conscious and eats very well. Mm. And um, but it's interesting because we all eat differently. Moni's really good at accommodating all our different needs. Like Mike is active and needing just a lot of energy, so you know he eats a lot. And I'm trying to, you know, be active, but I'm 46 and I don't need as much energy. And I'm mm. trying. Um, uh, trying to lose weight or stay leanish. Um, you where... did in a powerlifting comp with yeah, me, though. Yeah, I did. I did. That was a lot of fun. That was cool. Yeah, and sometimes trying to recover from a powerlifting <laughs> meet, which is pretty intense. From the torture chamber. Yeah, um, and then Moni's like you know same age and and uh, type one diabetic, so she's eating different again. So yeah, there's um, she'll just eat. A lot of time a steak for lunch and that, like a really big steak is the first meal and dinner mm. with the family and she doesn't eat much more than that because she doesn't need to because she's not I'm moving eating two to three times yeah. Her that. yeah yeah he's eating a lot more than her there was so, some chicken mints for dinner tonight <laughs> for everybody <laughs> apparently for four people but it only <laughs> fed one <laughs> <laughs> you, but you, you know, you, you, you're neither, you're still growing. Mm, you, you're definitely. not only growing, but you're also growing muscle. So, <laughs> yeah. so your context is very different. Um, but it's, it's interesting because, you know, even within my family, I'm the only type one diabetic, but we're all sort mm. of lower, lower carb, mm. Low don't carb, eat junk like food. It. Um, yeah. we're all lower carb people, but I mean, we've it and it's, okay not everyone needs to sit down and have similar identical plates i always think you know allow for some variation you know mm -hmm. like you know um to, <laughs> my husband wouldn't eat you know my husband is very similar to me but you know mm -hmm. like my daughter does does have fruit and it's okay mm -hmm. you know it's yeah. it's fine to have some variation within a family it's not mm -hmm. like everyone needs to sit down and eat you know the same yeah mm. but it's handy if you don't have a whole lot of junk food in the house and, and not you being go, tempted to eat trash can food. you imagine that telling the teenage type one diabetic while everybody else is eating the junk all the time <laughs> you can't have this it just wouldn't work so the will hammer down donuts look me directly in the eye <laughs> <laughs> so the family has to change what they eat um to some degree to really make it work for the for the type one and that ten supportive that tends to make the whole family a whole lot healthier as well. And as a teacher, you'd know that like Moni's a teacher as well. And you can tell the behavior of the kids by 
what they've got in their lunchbox at school. It's crazy, all the mm. colorings and sugar, and it just sends them loopy. Mm. And, uh, you know, drinking juice instead of water. Um, mm. I mean, a lot of children, it's quite shocking, but they just, they don't drink water. So they can't even drink water because they go, oh, it doesn't taste of anything. Because <laughs> they're used to the sweet juice, yeah. juice taste, right? It's shocking. Mm. Yeah. Um, Liquid okay, calories so, is never a good idea. <laughs> oh gosh, yeah. I, um, yeah, it does affect uh, you know their uh, sort of their concentration levels, mm. but also their behavior. Yeah, mm. it's common to have like a can of Coke for dinner or something. Mm. That's scary. Because mm. you're having an extra three hundred or so calories and That's empty calories. Yeah, and you don't feel full because of those calories. So you just it, you just gain weight because of it mm. Mm. Yeah. so how do you um so do you have a late meal and if you do how do you because you're not on the looping system so how do you sort of control your blood sugars because you will have a delayed mm. uh sort of rise for mm. protein with protein, protein right how, how do how do you deal with it if you're having a uh mm. dinner you're having your dinner say i don't know 8 p.m and then you're mm -hmm. you're in bed at 11 mm -hmm. right you're probably gonna have your rise at 1 a.m in morning or 2 a.m mm. in morning you know six, four to six hours later so what do you do um that would pop up on the percentile chart with extra then it would say i'm going above this number i'm going above seven at about 1 a.m. in the night. And then dad would up my basils at 1 a.m. in the night to bring it down. So if I just eat the same thing or similar amount mm. of fat to protein ratio and fat to protein to carb ratio and a similar amount of calories, it kind of all gets done by just the basil. Yeah, the basil handles a lot of it. But yeah, generally you have dinner at five or six together and he might have a late night snack. Mm -hmm. Who knows what he does after you go to sleep. But uh, <laughs> he's generally pretty good at dozing, dosing and, and uh, then he's got the... I get a little bing on my phone whenever I go above yeah. six after 8 p.m. Yeah. So it'll wake me up if I go above six. and Yeah. yeah. So we're definitely looking forward to having the closed loop which will handle that a whole lot better through the night and dad won't have to listen to bing 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 every minute <laughs> <laughs> at 1am in the morning my he's learned to sleep through yeah it <laughs> which is unfortunate you, does it wake you sometimes up sometimes i yeah. sleep through well, it you sleep through it yeah it's a 50 50 ratio definitely but but i'm i'm up early he goes to bed late so i'll watch his cgm when i wake up in the morning and if he needs to, I'll go down and say, hey, Mike, you need some insulin or hey, you need some glucose. But generally, it's pretty well controlled. Mm -hmm. So how about, you know, we talked about temptation earlier on, mm -hmm. like if you have all these, uh, you know, delicious carbs, carb fats, mm -hmm. processed, mm -hmm. processed carbs and fats, you know, yeah. at all. So you might be tempted to sort of, uh, you know, to cheat. But do mm -hmm. you guys make, Monica's the, uh, the chef, right? So do you yeah, guys she's make... Great. Um, low carb versions of I don't know some desserts and you know dark and waffles. Stuff. Yeah, yeah, dark and waffles are a big hit. Yeah, well, which is basically a protein powder and with a little mm. bit of butter. It's like a higher protein, higher fat sort of snacky thing that tastes really good. But we don't don't do a lot of that sort of stuff. Moni does from our old keto days to a few higher fat things and when mike was initially diagnosed it was like mm. here's all the yummy food for your son to make type one okay <laughs> like high fat yummy food but most of the time it's real food and we don't rely on that a lot you don't get um, a lot of cravings for the really yummy stuff when the sugar's taken out of it mm. it's kind of like yeah you definitely get that little dopamine hit taken out of it mm. you don't have that amount of sugar in it yeah, so uh, not many uh, low carb uh, pizzas in your uh, meal plans, right? <laughs> no, we haven't done a fathead pizza for about nine years. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mikey's going, what's that? Yeah. <laughs> Sounds good. Let's make that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I make uh, low carb cakes 
probably oh, okay. three times in the year. Um, okay. You know, uh, uh, one at Christmas and mm. <laughs> one at uh, our birthdays, but not mine. I'm just plus mm. I don't want the cake for my birthday, but they're, yeah. you know, low carb versions. And you know, I have blood sugars, even with low carb cake, right? I mm. might have, I don't know, almond flour or coconut flour or, um, you know, some kind of sweetener, stevia or whatever. Even with that, my blood sugars like are out of control for about 48 hours. And I think, yeah. oh gosh, you know, on my birthday, I definitely don't want any. <laughs> I want my bet for my birthday is sanity. <laughs> that had blood shoot. No, stable blood shoot. When is your birthday, Mike? Oh, February the eleventh. Oh, so it's coming up. So what? Yeah. So, so what? So so, uh, so how do you celebrate it if you're not having Ooh. a cake? What I mean, <laughs> that's uh, puzzling for most people, right? You we, we, we just got this thing. mega barbecue. So uh, oh. we, we, we've been. I think we'll be doing a lot of steak. And, I want a tomahawk uh, steak or something. Tomahawk, <laughs> yeah, I got a, I got a tomahawk steak for my fortieth yeah, birthday. I think. That was that cool. was great. Anyway, that was massive. Yeah, we'd have to do it. <laughs> We're getting a Ted Duckin for Christmas. <laughs> it's a monstrosity. What is it? It's a chicken in a turkey in a duck. So it's Which, three things inside of each other. We're, we're having the in laws over for a delayed Christmas party tomorrow. So that's that's what's for lunch and and, and the vegetarian is having something else probably not going to have the duck and i'm pretty sure there's probably going to bring like a cross in and go Whoa. there's there's biblical laws in leviticus against <laughs> <laughs> those sorts of things but anyway the wife thought it'd be fun that's amazing that sounds amazing yes. i think what i love now you see this mm -hmm. didn't exist like even two years ago i couldn't see anything like this on social media but now mm -hmm. uh like People are like posting um, typical Christmas puddings or desserts mm -hmm. or um, Thanksgiving uh, sort of mm -hmm. desserts or favorites, but all mm -hmm. made of meat, right? Mm -hmm. Meat and vegetables yeah, wow. like, or cakes made of, or it's not a cake, <laughs> but yeah, you know what looks like a cake meat. and people are putting candles on it, but it's all meat and cheese and, you know, lower yeah, fat vegetables. So these these images like always oh, brighten my day when i look oh, man, that's creative i'm not that creative i don't know if monica is a creative cook i cook i cook well i love cooking mm. but the but creativity is part creative. is on top of it and i can't be bothered with that you know yeah yeah carnival is really blown up a lot of people are Carnival's doing that sort keto. of thing yeah and um in our in our micros master class everybody's trying to work out how to get more liver into their diet so someone made a, a liver cake the other day that actually looked pretty good and every, a lot of people got excited about it so this crazy environment where people are <laughs> celebrating liver which is a bit weird but uh you know it's good to see people chasing their micronutrients yeah that that's it, it really is and you know eating real food rather than yeah. you know uh like sugary or flour sort of based cake right uh, um, yeah definitely just empty calories yeah Mike, we're going to wrap this up, uh, mm -hmm. but you, I would like you to uh, tell us uh, about your uh, record-breaking powerlifting. So tell us Record. all the details, Ooh. and we're going to finish off with that positive note to <laughs> inspire everyone, adults or teenagers, <laughs> um, that you can have a normal life. In fact, you can yeah. break records, <laughs> world records with type 1 diabetes. Mm. Mike, tell us the, the details. Well. Um, so we had uh, not of the deadlift thing, so it's a uh, national competition, but it's done each state separately. So I was like, cool, just down the road, Brisbane, we can get there. And um, yeah, walked in. There was about 110 competitors. It was absolutely massive. Um, first attempt to beat the record by two kilos. Yeah, there, there, there was this world record that he'd been eyeing off for about oh, nine months we've got a said, poster <laughs> he's, he's got it on the wall of i need to get a lift 213 kilos be under 82.5 kilos body weight and he'd been eyeing it off for quite a while so he'd been training very hard for it yeah so we broke by two kilos on the first lift and then you get four you get three attempts but because it's a world record you got a fourth attempt which didn't actually count towards the 
total but did count towards the record so mm. i just went up in 10 kilo increments and beat it by 32 kilos yeah so got 140 145 at uh, 245 kilos. 245 sorry yeah, so it's a slight so, <laughs> so you were in the category of under 18s obviously and yeah under i mean this is this is from your facebook uh post so under eight, uh, 82.5 mm -hmm. kilograms yeah. so yeah. what what was your weight at the time 81 81.5 yeah. yeah and so the the so the so the previous world record was 212.5 mm -hmm. kilograms yep and you smashed it with what 245 mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, and we'll go back next year and smash it again. <laughs> He's got another year to yeah. beat that. <laughs> and break your own records, your own yes. record as well. What That's I do, amazing. What I want to do is take advantage of time zones <laughs> and then just fly to every state and get Michael, Michael, Michael on all the weight categories. Yeah, why not? Yeah. Why not? Why not? Anyway. Do you have an extra <laughs> 10 grand or so to fly to every I don't know who's paying for those plane flights, man. <laughs> I'm but... sure mowing will go well. <laughs> Ramp up the mowing business. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Um, now I actually see why uh, you wanted mm -hmm. to, because uh, you did mention, Marty, that you, you know you wanted him to, to lose some weight. So that's why you Yeah, you had to, had to drop out. down to get yeah. under the 82.5 mm -hmm. limits. So there was a little bit of weight loss and a little, a little bit, of, bit of a cut. A little bit of water manipulation at the end, which was quite interesting. You mm. just sort of drink a bit of extra water and then don't drink as much water in the last day and have a hot mm. bath. And it's amazing how quickly the water weight comes yeah. off. Our coach was just very relaxed about it. And dad was like, <sighs> yeah. yeah. So, yeah, it was actually quite easy in the long run. He did well. So do you think next year, Mike, you mm -hmm. will be that same weight or you might? Oh, I think we'll the next bulk up to about 90 kilos because I don't have any competition. I don't think I'm going to compete this year because it's grade 12, big year. Worlds is right as my ATAR exam starts. Yeah. So we're probably not going to go to Worlds. And, so it's, in, not... and it's in Edinburgh. Yeah. <laughs> so... <laughs> Anyway. so might not do that but so yeah there's not too much of a reason to try and lean down might as well just improve your performance because as soon as you get over 18 you have to start competing against people with roids so we're going to put in the hard work to beat the roids <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah that's going to be a more so, uh much tougher uh competition mm, for over 18 but you've got two years to focus mm -hmm. on your studies, mm -hmm, focus mm -hmm. on your training, and I wish you all the best. Thank you. With anything you do in your life. And thank you so much, Mike and Marty, for coming to the channel and sharing your um, insights and your stories you. with uh, our type one diabetic audience who might be watching this. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for having us on. It's been a whole lot of fun. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Thank you so much. Bye for now. Thank See you. Ya. Thank you.